good to be with you this morning. How are we doing this morning? Oh, I'm so glad to hear it. I am so glad to hear it. Well, welcome in. Welcome if you're new, if you're joining us for the first time, second time, third or fourth time. Um, we're so, so happy you're here. If you're new this morning, would you raise your hand? I was totally just kidding, but I love the commitment. Um, that's so scary. Props to you for doing that in this room. I'm just kidding. Uh, I just want to invite you to our newcomers lunch after second service today. And so what that is, is it's just an opportunity for you to come meet people that are a part of our church, um, learn a little bit more about Frontline, and there's free lunch, which what is better than free lunch, right? So come on out to that today. But man, we're here to worship the Lord this morning, okay? Let's stand. And I don't know about you, but I want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to hear the Holy Spirit's voice. And I'm just desperate for the Holy Spirit's leading in my life. And so this song that we're going to sing is simply that, a song, a prayer of desperation and desire for the Holy Spirit's leading in our life. So even if you don't know it, let the words sink into your heart. Feel free to lift a hand, bow in reverence, and let's worship together this morning.
wisdom or comfort. So go ahead and just out loud or in your heart, pray a prayer to the Holy Spirit right now.
Would you bow your heads and pray with me? God, it's just with the, the words of that song that we just sang, we are reminded that you are Lord. You are King. You're over everything, everything that's going on in our world right now. Everything going on in our world right now. Maybe in families, maybe with health, maybe in our context of neighborhoods or workplaces, overseas, if we think about Ukraine and Russia and Israel and Palestine, you are Lord of all. You are over all. And so we worship you just because you're worthy. You're worthy to be praised. And so uh, today, what we ask, Holy Spirit, is that we would just be totally submitted to you and what it is that you want to do in our hearts and in us as part of your church, as a people. We just want to submit to that. So we invite you in, Holy Spirit. We just want you here. We want you in the space. We want you here right now. We want you to lead us, to guide us. We want you to speak to us. And we pray also, God, that you would find us to be a people that wants to praise you and worship you with all of our hearts. So we're grateful for you. Thank you for the person of Jesus who died on a cross for us. We love you. It's in his name that we pray and all God's people said together, amen. Awesome. We can have a seat. Well, good morning. It's just good to see all of you. It's great to worship with you as well. My name is David. I'm the lead pastor here at Frontline. And man, that's just like my favorite part of Sundays is just getting to worship. Uh, I love just closing my eyes and envisioning, like I, I'm worshiping the God of all of creation, all of time, all of history, who wants a, re a relationship with us. It's just so special. So uh, it's good to be with you. It's good to have you here today. Uh, I got a couple things to share with you that I'm excited about. One is, as you walked in today uh, in the lobby, you probably noticed there's a giant hole uh, in this part of our building, and it's where our new essential store is actually going. So if you don't know this about Frontline, we have an essential store, which is really a missional arm into our community of helping some of the most at-risk uh, demographics and people that we live next to and among. And so this essential store provides things like toilet paper and shampoo and toothpaste and deodorant. And so it, it has provided all of these things for the last couple of years, and it has done so in a part of our building that's pretty far removed from uh, a lot of the rest of our church. So we're relocating that, we're moving that. So we have an invite for you is we need help moving a bunch of that. Uh, we need help moving product and shelving and computers and all sorts of stuff. So if you're looking for a fun project that's kind of hands-on, you can do it as a family, you can invite some friends to do it. We're going to be doing that on November 4th from 9 o'clock until 12 o'clock. So if you'd like to join and be a part of that, it's frontlinejira.com slash sent. Please join us. We need a lot of, lot of help for that day. Also, some of the finishing touches, putting up shelves and and whatnot over in the new essential store. So that'll be awesome. And uh, I'd love to invite you for that. The other thing I wanna invite you to is if you are between sixth grade and 12th grade, or if you have a sixth to 12th grader, uh, we are doing an event tonight. It's throughout the entire Zero Collective. So all four churches here in Grand Rapids, and it's gonna be at the Three Mile Project. And so the, the purpose of this event is to, is to have fun, it's to invite all of the other churches, and then also provide an opportunity for all of the students at all of these churches to invite friends. Uh, it's gonna be an awesome time. A couple pictures behind me. They have a Ninja Warrior course. They got basketball and volleyball. They got video games and movie theaters. I mean, there's so much to do. So tonight, it's from 4 p.m. until 8 p.m. Uh, food's provided, it's 10 bucks per student. So, but if that's a barrier, just tell somebody, tell anybody on our staff, we'll take care of cost for you. We just want this to be an opportunity for your student to really get connected here with our ministry, but also uh, to, to have an opportunity to respond to the gospel and what Jesus is doing and invite a friend along with them uh, tonight. So don't miss that. Don't miss an opportunity to do that or to bring your kids to that if that... Uh, is you. So the last one is this, is just offering. We get to move into a time of offering. Uh, and I, I just want to say thank you to those of you that are, are giving so regularly. Uh, we, we talk about tithe, and the Bible talks about what a tithe is all throughout the Bible. It, it's 10%. It is the first 10% that comes from our income that we get to give to the local church. But then an offering, as the Bible would describe offering, is above and beyond that. And so there's always a variety of different things that we could do or give uh, on top of that for offerings. And one of them today, I mean, I, I already talked about it, 
would be our essential store. If that moves you, if that moves your heart, if you go, man, that, I, I would like to be a part of that in more ways than even just than serving with my hands, but maybe, maybe financially or maybe I could help behind the scenes uh, in a logistic sort of way or sourcing product, donating product. If, there, if that moves your heart, uh, there's always opportunities to give and to come alongside something like that here at our church. So I just want to invite you to be a part of that. So uh, this next section here that we're going to move into, and it's really a special time, and it's why probably a lot of you are here today, uh, it's called child dedication. So child dedication uh, is something that we celebrate here at Frontline. We do it just about a couple times a year. So this is Pastor Amanda. Everybody say hi, Pastor Amanda. And uh, this is a really fun part of the service that we're not going to do for you. We're actually going to invite you in to be a part of it. So, Like David had said, today is child dedication, and it is one of my favorite Sundays. Um, and that is just because we get to be here as a church and come alongside these families who want to raise their children to love and know Jesus. These parents are making the commitment to say, yes, Jesus, I'm gonna raise my children to know you until that one day they say yes to you for, them very, for, for their very selves. And we get to be a part of that, um, not only as the, the church, but also as their village. Our role is to come alongside these parents who hold the primary spiritual role of their children and to love on them and to just cheer them on as they go. So we're gonna get started this morning. The families are gonna come up and we're gonna get, get this ball rolling. All right, if you can go ahead and introduce your family for us. Hi, uh, we're the Probst family. Uh, my name's Michael Valerie Briel. Briel. Beckett, and today we're dedicating Aiden. Thank you. Perfect. All Stop. right. Hi, Aiden. We're going to put our hands on you, okay? <laughs> Did I get a five? Aiden, no. we now dedicate you the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. Amen. Awesome. Good job. Awesome. You guys can go right up there. Open your Bibles, is what he said. Open your Bibles. We're ready to preach. Yep, that's Maverick. Uh, we're the Green Deck family. My name is Mark. This is my wife, Britt. This is Xander, and we're going to be dedicating Maverick today. Perfect. All right. So, Maverick, today we dedicate you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. All right. Hello, we're the Esser family. This is um, my son, George Esser, my husband, Rob Esser, and today we're dedicating our daughter, Eleanor Esser. Perfect. Go ahead. All right. Eleanor, we now dedicate you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm Brian Heck, this is my wife Sarah Heck, and this is Ezekiel, so we'll be dedicating Ezekiel. All right. So Ezekiel, today we dedicate you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right, we are the Richardsons. My name is Brandon. This is my wife, Marjan, and we will be dedicating Amara. Perfect. Amara, today we dedicate you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Can we just sit in this moment for a second? Look at these beautiful children. What a gift 
from God, that is. Um, I'm reminded of a passage in Luke. It says, people are also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch him. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children and said, let these little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these, and I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. That is exactly what these parents are doing today. They're coming before the Lord saying, God, touch my children, bless my children. And they're making the commitment to raise their kids to not only know what it means to, to love Jesus, but the actions to it. They're, they're saying, I'm gonna teach my kids not only the scriptures, but how to be the hands and feet, how, how to be out in our communities, how to love and how to show God's love. And so that is just, this is such a great, great thing. Um, but church, I see that you, you know, you're just sitting here and, and, and just wanna remind you, you have a huge role in this. These parents, you've all, most of you have been parents or no parents, parenting is hard. It is so hard, and you get the opportunity to be these, church, these families, this church, their village, to cheer them on, to encourage them in the good seasons and in the hard seasons. So in a second here, Pastor David's going to pray, but just as a symbol of your partnership with these families, I ask that you raise your hand towards them as we pray. <clears throat> all right, let's pray together. So God, uh, just thank you for what you're doing just in the life of our church, in the lives of all of these families, God, just like Amanda said, we all know that parenting is hard. Uh, at every level, it's hard. And so uh, we just lift them up to you. And, and Father, we just submit ourselves uh, to you to play whatever role it is that you call us to play. Maybe that's to pray for these families and commit to praying for them. Maybe, maybe there's other relatives in here, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles and cousins. Uh, maybe it's to play a, a different role as one that can, that can pray more specifically or regularly. Maybe it's one that, that regularly takes time to invest in these kids as they grow up. Maybe for the rest of us, it's serving in children's or students. Maybe, maybe whatever it is, God, we just make ourselves available to invest in the lives of not just these kids, but in the next generation. Uh, that's your church, God. That's the story of your church is going after the next generation over and over and over again. So uh, we pray for them. We lift them up. We ask that you would bless them, God, especially in this season right now where it's hard in a different way. Um, we pray that we'd make ourselves available and that we would come alongside all of these parents as they are the number one discipler of these kids. So we love you. We're grateful for you. We lift all of these families and kids up to you in Jesus' name and all God's people said together. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, as they head out, uh, can we just say thank you one more time? And uh, perfect. perfect. And check out this short video. Wow. Good morning, Frontline. Man, it's so good to be uh, back with you again. Is there anything better than just getting to gather and celebrate just children, new life uh, that God has just continued to bless and bring to the church? Um, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, uh, if I'm a new face to you, my name is Brian. I serve as the senior pastor of the Zero Collective Network. You may not have known this, uh, but Frontline is a part of this network of churches in the greater Grand Rapids area going after the name of Jesus together. And in fact, it all started with Frontline. And so uh, for my wife and I and our family, Frontline is home and it's good to be home today. It's good to see you guys all again. If you're joining with us online, great to have you as well. And uh, today we're wrapping up this series we've been working our way through at all the Zero Collective churches called Anchored. We're talking about when storms of life come, the gospel gives us these anchors we can, build, we can root our lives in that help us uh, be secure. And so the, the final anchor we're talking about in this series 
uh, we're looking at today is the promises of God from Scripture. How do we anchor our lives into the promises of God in Scripture? Uh, this past June, it was like a sweltering hot uh, June day. Some of you remember back in June when we had that kind of heat wave that happened. Middle of the day, there was a knock on our front door of our house. And so uh, my wife answered the door, Carrie, she opens the door, and there, standing there at, at the front door of our house, is uh, a salesman, uh, this 21-year-old kid. And, and by the way, you know you're old when you call a 21-year-old a kid, but that's exactly what he was, this 21-year-old salesman, and he, is, he announces that he is from this company right here, uh, Vivant. Anybody, by the way, uh, how many of you know what Vivant actually sells? Anybody? R raise your hand. What, what does Vivant sell? Shout it out. Home security systems. Yeah, I heard it somewhere. So he announces, I'm from Vivant. I'm here. I, I would like to sell you a home security system. And uh, we actually, I don't know about you guys, we get a whole lot of these door-to-door -door salesmen in our neighborhood. And so whenever my wife answers the door, she, she handled this the same way she handles every single door-to-door -door salesman who comes to our house. She took the door and she opened it as wide as she could. And she said, oh, great to meet you. Come on in. Won't you come in? And she led him through our house through to our dining room table, sat him down, and since it was a, such a hot day, she said, oh, man, it's so hot. Would you like a glass of ice water? And he was like, yeah, sure, I, I would. So she gets him a nice cold glass of ice water, and when she was sure that he was just as comfortable as he could possibly be, she went and found me somewhere in the house, and she said, hey, there's a guy at our kitchen table who wants to talk to you. <laughs> Seriously. I'm not kidding. This is what she does with everybody who comes to our door. I try to beat her to the front door so this doesn't happen. I'm like, there's no way I'm doing that by myself. You're going to go to the table with me. So we go up. The two of us sit down at the dining room table, and this kid begins his speech, right? And he starts telling us about all this technology that I didn't even know existed. 4K cameras, like doorbell cameras, uh, smoke detectors that will actually call the fire department for you. Uh, glass breaking sensors that will alert the, the police that your house is being broken into. He's telling us about all this technology and all these different things that can be done with a, a home security system, but at the same time, he is also telling us all the different ways that someone can break into your house. I had no idea how many different ways you could break into somebody's house. Uh, so Carrie and I were terrified by the end of this conversation. My trust in humanity is just going down the longer he talks. And so finally, he gets to the end of his speech, and he tells us the great deal, right? It's the sales pitch. Here, here's the great deal that uh, he could give us so that we could feel safe again in our home, you know, like we did before he came to our door. <laughs> and here's what I learned from that whole experience. Did you know home security systems cost a fortune? In fact, I did some research. We're spending more right now in our nation in home security than we ever have in any time in history before. Home, you can spend tens of thousands of dollars if you want to on a home security system. And, and the reason why we invest, the reason why we say yes, by the way, we did not say yes. You could break into my home today if you want. Um, the, the reason that we invest in those things is because home security systems make a promise to us. And the promise that a home security system makes is if you invest in me, your home will be secure. Your home will be safe. I want you to think about all the other things in our world that make similar promises to us. If you invest in me, I can make you secure. Uh, beauty, right? En endless beauty routines or whatever it is, beauty makes the promise. If you invest in me, your youth will be secure. You'll never grow old. Uh, the stock market makes the promise. It says, if you invest in me, your future will be secure. Um, maybe our job performance at work. If you develop the skills you need, if you really get good at your, God, at your job, if you invest in me, the promise is your position will always be secure at your job. And, and the problem with that, what we're talking about today, is it's not wrong to invest in any of those things. In fact, it's probably wise to invest in many things like that. But none of those things can actually deliver on what they promise with 100% certainty, right? No matter how much you invest in beauty, you might, I'm just saying you might, you might get old someday. It might happen. No matter how much you invest in the stock market, 
something unexpected may happen. There might be an economic downturn. You might have a financial crisis personally, and it might drain all of your savings. It might happen. Your job, no matter how hard you work at your job, no matter how good you are at it, you might get outsourced. You might be pushed into early retirement. It might happen. The only thing that we can root our lives in that has 100% security are the promises of God. The promises of God are different than anything else in our lives because they actually make our lives and our eternity secure. But here's the catch. Only if we invest, only if we anchor in them, do they make our lives secure. So we're looking at this today. This passage of Scripture we've been looking at, the, it's been our anchor passage, no, no, no pun intended, for this entire series is Hebrews 6. It says, uh, Therefore we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. So that's what we've been looking at, the, these anchors that we have for our soul. And a few verses before this in Hebrews 6 the, uh, the writer of Hebrews gives us an example uh, talking about the promises of God. So this is verses uh, 13 through 15. It says, for example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name saying, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently and he received what God had promised. Now, I hope you see what that's saying. What it's saying is that God made this promise to Abraham. He made this, this promise on oath to Abraham that Abraham was a character early on in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, and then God was faithful to come through and deliver on that promise. But I don't know if you noticed, Abraham had a part to play in that as well. Did you catch it? What did Abraham have to do? He had to wait. It says, Abraham waited patiently for God to come through on his promise. Which doesn't sound so bad, right? I mean, waiting patiently, you're just kind of chilling out, uh, just kind of hanging out, waiting for God to come through, have a Coke, watch a game. That, that doesn't sound so bad, does it? But what we're talking about, if you actually read the story of Abraham, we're going to look at it here in a moment. What we see is that this wasn't just sort of hanging out, chilling out, relaxing, waiting for God to come through. What, what we're talking about really is Abraham had to wait uh, where, where there was no clarity. Go ahead to that next one if you would. There, he had to wait without any sort of clarity on how God was going to come through and how he was going to, to bring about his promise. Can I just tell you, waiting without clarity, those times in our lives, crush us. These are the times of our lives that are the most perplexing, the most difficult, where we bear the heaviest burdens, when we have to wait without any clarity. Here's what... The story tells us in the book of Genesis, it says that Abraham had lack of clarity on how God would come through on his promises. So when Abraham was 75 years old, 75, God made a promise to Abraham that God would give him a son. Just like we celebrated families that have been blessed and given children, God promised at 75 years old that Abraham and his wife Sarah, they had no children up to this point, that they would have a son. And when that son was born, that son would become the father of a great nation and the entire world would be blessed through their son. Now, that sounds great, right? But what it says in Genesis 21, verse 5, is it says that when Abraham was 100 years old, that's when Sarah finally gave birth to Isaac. So from 75 years old to 100 years old, that 25-year period of time, that's what Hebrews 6 is talking about. From 75 to 100, 25 years, Abraham and Sarah waited. And it's not like they're waiting through their 20s, like, yeah, we'll probably get pregnant at some point. No, you're 75, now you're 80, now you're 90. How's God going to do this? How's he going to come through? And if you know the story of Abraham, during those 25 years, with every monthly disappointment, with every passing birthday, the pressure just keeps rising. How's God going to do it? How's he going to come through? And if you, if you follow that story, you know some of the worst decisions that we make in our lives happen during times in our lives where we're having to wait on a promise of God with no clarity of how he's going to do it. Because the temptation becomes, maybe I should just take matters into my own hands, right? When I'm waiting and I have no clarity on how God's going to do it, the pressure just keeps rising 
And so I find myself start looking to compromise. Like, well, God, you know, I know you've called me to tithe, but, you know, right now during this time, I just, I don't know how you're going to come through for me. Maybe I better take matters into my own hands when it comes to my finances. God, you know, when it comes to, to my future, I, I know I should trust you, but maybe I better take matters into my own hands. I, I'm waiting for Mr. Wright, but maybe I'll just take Mr. who's available right now. So, sometimes when we're waiting in those moments, we make some of the worst decisions of our lives because we just take matters back into our own hands. We just say, God, I, I'm, I'll compromise on this piece of my life, this place of integrity in my life. I'll compromise. I'll take it back into my own hands. Everybody else at work is doing it. I might as well too because I don't know how you're going to come through. I don't know how you're going to be there for me. I just don't see it. Waiting is extremely hard. So I just want to ask you, what about you? Where are you waiting right now? Where, where do you want clarity on something in your life right now? And it would just mean the world to you if God would just make it clear. How, how does he want to take care of this situation? I'll tell you what it is for me. Right now, I want clarity about my diagnosis. So uh, when I was 38 years old, I was diagnosed with a form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, I'm right now in remission, but every, every six months, I've shared this uh, with uh, you guys before, every six months I go in for these full body CT scans and the purpose is to determine am I still in remission. I've had to go through radiation and then a round of chemotherapy and at some point they're expecting there, there's probably going to be more. And so uh, September was uh, when I just had my most recent CT scans and praise God I still am in remission, but there's always just these little pieces of information they kind of give you like, yeah, but you're not out of the woods yet. And I will tell you, those moments where I'm waiting, when we get to the month of the scan, and we get to like the week before the scan, where you're just waiting and your you're lack of clarity, all these unanswered questions, you know, am I, how, long am I, how long am I going to have in remission? That's an area I would love clarity on. What's the next round of treatment going to be like? What am I going to have to go through? Or, or even more importantly, what's my family going to have to go through this next time? Those are questions that have no answers and I will tell you this, that week we get up to scan time, that is the loneliest that I feel in my life. I can be in a room full of people like this right now, and I feel utterly alone. I can have my family and my friends around me. It is the most alone I feel in my life when we get to those points. Where do you want clarity? How does uh, the promises of God, how does it actually make a difference? Here's what I came to offer you today. Here's the hope I came to share with you that I, that I found to be extremely helpful in those moments in my life. And so uh, go ahead, if you will, to that next slide. I just want to ask the question, what if there is something better than clarity? What, what if what God gives us in Scripture and the promises that he has for us in Scripture, what if, what if there's something actually better than clarity? We all want clarity. But what if God actually wants us to give, to give us something better? And so what I want to do is I want to go to Genesis chapter 15. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how God speaks to Abraham during this waiting time in his life. So, so Genesis 15 takes place somewhere between age 75 and age 100, okay? It's somewhere in that 25-year period of time in Abraham's life where he is waiting on God, and he has no idea how God's going to do it. And so uh, Genesis 15, verse 8, what happens is Abraham is doubting. He's discouraged, and he needs, uh, he needs an anchor. He needs God to speak. And so in verse 8, he says, God, how can I be sure? How can I be sure you're going to fulfill your promise to me? This is what God says in Genesis 15, verse 9. The Lord told him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abram presented all these to him and killed them. Then he cut each animal down the middle and laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. Well, thank God for that, right? Do you ever, do you ever uh, find yourself reading the Bible, and you come to this story in the Bible, and you know, you're reading it through our, our you know, Western, modern eyes, and, you just, and you're just like, what? What in the world is going on here? This is just one of those just weird stories that just makes no sense to us out of context in our world. So Abraham is literally like, God, how, are, how do I know you're going to come through? How do you and God is like, I got it. Bring me some farm animals. And then did you notice, God never tells Abraham what to do with the farm animals. It's like he just knows. He takes them and he cuts them in half and he arranges them in this kind of like path. 
It's like he knows what to do. What's happening here in this passage of Scripture is something in the ancient Near East that was called either cutting the covenant or the blood path is what we have referred to it today. So in ancient times, in the ancient Near East, they, they didn't have lawyers. They didn't have signed paper contracts. You know, when you had to have like a binding legal agreement, uh, binding legal agreements were formed by the spoken word and by the shedding of blood. All binding legal agreements in the ancient world were spoken word, shedding of blood. And so here's what you would do. When you had two parties that were going to make an agreement between each other, they were going to make a binding promise, a promise agreement. This is what they do. They would cut these animals in half, and they would line them up in what was called a blood path. So there's this path. And then the first person, like I would stand on one end of it, and you would stand on the other, and I would say, I promise to build the fence, or, or whatever it is. I promise to build that fence for you. And then you would say, and if I fail to uphold my end of the covenant, may I be like these animals. And then what you would do is you would walk the blood path, and you would feel the blood of the animals in between your toes, on your feet, and, and that, then the, the covenant would be binding. And then the other person, they would take their turn, and the other person standing on their side of the blood path would say, I promise to pay you X amount of dollars for the fence. Whatever, I'm just making something up. And then you would say, if I fail to uphold my end of the covenant, may I be like one of these animals here. May I be put to death and, and cut in half. And then you would walk the blood path, and you would feel the, the blood beneath your feet, and then the covenant would be binding. So this is what God, Abraham's like, how do I know you're going to do it, God? And God says, go get some animals. Let's, let's do the covenant. And so this is God in this moment confirming this covenant. God is literally saying, till death do us part. Abraham, you do your part, and I'll do my part. We're going to make a covenant. But then God does something absolutely breathtaking. To me, it's one of the most breathtaking, beautiful things that happens in the entire Old Testament of the Bible. You can read it in Genesis 15. What happens is when they get to that point, the animals are all arranged, God causes Abraham to fall into a deep sleep. Abraham never walks the blood path, and God walks the blood path for both of them. Do you understand what God's saying there? What God is saying to Abraham in that moment, when God walks the blood path, only himself, only for, uh, not just for himself, but for Abraham also, God is saying, Abraham, I want you to understand something. You may fail me but I will never fail you. You may let me down. You may blow it on your end of the covenant, but it doesn't depend on you, Abraham. I will never blow it. I will never fail. I will never let you down. In fact, even, Abraham, even if you don't do your part, I will do your part on your behalf to fulfill it. And why is that so significant? Why is that such an incredible moment in Scripture? It's because Abraham did fail, and so did we, every human being ever since. And Jesus was torn apart like those animals on the cross. What we see in Jesus Christ is we see God fulfilling his promise that he made to Abraham that Jesus, when he offered his life sacrificially for us on the cross, he was saying, it doesn't depend on your behavior. It doesn't depend on whether you fulfill your end of it. It doesn't, fulfill, it doesn't matter about your merit, your things that you bring to the table, your good works. I'm going to do it on your behalf because you couldn't do it for yourself. And Jesus took the penalty. He was torn in half. And because of that, he is the only one who can offer us eternal life. That's why in 2 Corinthians 1.20, uh, we still see God keeping this promise to us. Paul, it's brilliant, it's just this little sentence in 2 Corinthians 1.20, but it says so much. Paul says, all the promises of God are yes and amen for us in Jesus. What Paul's saying there is literally, all the promises that you find in Scripture are applied to us, not by our own merit, not by our own effort, not by the things, our good behavior and the ways that we would behave. All the promises of God are yes and amen. They are applied to us through our faith in the person of Jesus Christ. The promises of God are not true in your life because you're a good person. The promises of God are not true in your life because you make all the right decisions and avoid all the wrong ones. The promises of God are true for you, and you can claim them. You can anchor your life in them because you have your faith and your trust put securely in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's good news. Would you agree? 
That's good news when you face times in your life where you're waiting and you don't know what's, what, what's going to happen. So here's what I would say. Here's what I came to tell you today. What's better than clarity in our lives? Certainty. The thing that's better than clarity, the thing that God wants to offer us is better than clarity is certainty. I may not have clarity about my future and what I'm going to have to go through and what's going to happen, but I have certainty. See, when you come to Jesus and you put your faith and your trust in Jesus and you become a follower of Christ, your circumstances don't necessarily get more clear, but your certainty in the midst of those circumstances rises. And you become a person who is anchored in Christ, no matter what comes, no matter what's going to happen. I'm certain God is going to get me through this, even though I may not have clarity on what that means. So, is there a trust issue in your life right now? Is there somewhere in your life right now where you're looking, you wish God would just make it more clear? Go ahead to that next slide. if you. Yeah, there it is. Clarity makes life easier. We all want clarity, right? But certainty makes life secure. Clarity makes life easier. Sure, it'd be great to have clarity. But the certainty God gives us makes life secure. And that, my friends, is actually the better thing. Several months ago, I was at a pastor's gathering. Actually, with uh, Pastor Cody Mahaffey, uh, who's part of this church, our Connections pastor here. He and I were at this pastor's gathering together and so it was an all-day thing. We were, we were there gathered with a bunch of other pastors in our region, and we're trying to solve problems uh, of things that are happening in our region. It was this brainstorming session. And so we get to the end of this entire day together, and the facilitator who was in charge of um, this gathering literally says, hey, before we break today, I wonder if we could just have a time of prayer over one of our pastors in the room. And what, what he begins to reveal is that um, for one of our pastors in the room, uh, wonderful wife and mother and pastor and uh, uh, leading one of our churches, uh, she just found out just earlier that week, she had just found out that her son, her 12-year-old son, his name is Simon, was diagnosed with a terminal illness. It is 100% fatal, and he will die soon. He will not make it out of his teen years. And so he just said, could we just have a time, before he even got done explaining it, it's like everybody just stood up in the room. We just like instinctively, we all just gathered around her. I was heartbroken when I heard that news. We, we've done ministry things together. We, we've been involved in lots of different stuff together. I can't imagine what, what must be going through her head. And so we gather together, we're ready to pray, and the facilitator asks what, in my opinion, was the dumbest question you could possibly ask in that moment. He said, how would you like us to pray for you? Just to me, it's just like, Really? We're in a room full of pastors. How do you want us to pray? Like, let's pray for total healing, that the heavens would part, that God would come down, that he would heal her son totally, that he would be completely eradicated of this disease, that he would be completely set free from it. Of course, that's what we're going to pray for. Her answer shocked me. How do you want us to pray for you? Here's what she said. She said, you know, I'll always take prayer for miraculous healing. I believe God is a healer. I believe he can heal. I'll always take prayer for miraculous healing. But what I really want you to pray for, and what I've been praying for my son, is that God would give him a vision of heaven so that he is no longer afraid. And when she said it, something in me wanted to push back. Like, no, we're not going to pray for that. Are you kidding me? We're just going to pray for total, that would make me feel better. Let's just pray for total healing. But as we began to pray and we began to just engage, I, I, I realized something inside of me just testified like, no, she's right. What she's asking for is the bigger thing. It's the better thing. Because here's the, here's the thing. God has not promised physical healing. I believe God's a healer. I believe he can physically heal her son. I believe he can physically heal me, but God has not promised physical healing. What he has promised is an ultimate healing, something far better. He's promised certainty. John 14, Jesus says, behold, I go away to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. You can root your life on that promise. 
It's a promise of scripture that is ours. It's yes and amen because of the person of Jesus Christ, because of what he did for us. And that promise will not let you down. So we are talking about how to end this today. And I feel like the Holy Spirit just laid three different promises from scripture on my heart. And so... um, There's so many promises of scripture, again, that are ours, that are yes and amen, all of them in the person of Jesus, but three specifically today. So I wonder if if you fall into any one of these three categories. So what I want to do here in the next couple minutes is I just want to maybe invite you to just self-identify. And so with each one of these, if this is you, I want you to stand up and I want to speak a promise of scripture over you in the room. But not everybody, just only if if this is you, I want you to stand up. So the, the first one here, is uh, are you in a place right now, waiting without clarity, do you need guidance? Stand up if that's you. I wanna speak a promise of God from scripture over you. Thank you, you need guidance. There's situations you're just like, I have no idea what to do. Okay, for those of you in that situation right now, you're waiting without clarity. Proverbs three, five through six says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. He will guide you. That is a promise from God and scripture that is yours through your faith in the person of Jesus Christ. You can have a seat. Second group of people, uh, are you in a situation where you're overwhelmed? Stand up. You're, you're facing a situation where you're just like, I don't, I'm facing something that's too big for me. Yeah. Anxiety, depression, I mean, it, it, things are just at their breaking point. You're just completely and totally overwhelmed. You feel like you're drowning. These are Jesus' words in John 16, Jesus says, in me, you will have peace. In the world, you're going to have nothing but trouble. That's a promise. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. That is a promise of God in Scripture that is true for you. It's yours in Scripture through your faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Have a seat. Lastly, uh, do you feel alone? Anybody in this room, do you feel alone? This is the, I'm going to read this passage of Scripture over you. This is the one that I go to. I already told you there are times where I feel alone. Anybody right now, you just feel like I'm the only one. It's just, I'm the only one who deals with this. If that's you, if you feel alone, stand up, okay? I'm the only one facing this problem. Nobody else gets it. Nobody else understands. You just feel like you're by yourself. This is Isaiah 43. Or I'm sorry, Isaiah 41. It says this, Do not be afraid. For I have ransomed you. This is God speaking. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. I'll be with you. He is with you. You are not alone. You are not alone with whatever you're you're going through. That is a promise of God in Scripture. Would you join those who are standing, everybody in the room? To Jesus, right now, we just come to you and we just recognize, God, if there's anybody in this room who maybe we're saying, God, I, I really, I wish my circumstances were more clear. I wish you'd come through for me. But God, maybe we don't have that certainty of your promises. We don't have that certainty of what you've put in front of us for, and it, because our lives are not anchored in you. And so right now, G- Jesus, we just ask you to speak and you would move. And if there's anybody in this room or anybody watching online right now where you haven't put your faith and your trust in the person of Jesus, right now you can do that. You can just say, Jesus, I confess my sin to you. I repent of trying to take matters into my own hands. I repent of trying to be my own savior. And I ask you to be my Lord and savior. Will you come in? Will you cleanse me? Will you give me hope in you? And Jesus, we just stand on faith today, believing and knowing that we have certainty. Even in places in our life where we can't have clarity, we have certainty. We know that you have prepared a future for us, that you've, you've, provided for us an ultimate healing, an ultimate home, an ultimate security, an ultimate place that we can live and we can put our faith and our trust. God, help us to root our lives in that now. Help us not to listen to all the voices 
of panic and insecurity that are coming from all over the place in our world now, but help us to live lives that are completely anchored and rooted in you. And would you build us up? Would you make us strong as your church, Jesus? We just believe you. We believe that what you say is true. And in Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Amen. Can we just thank the Lord for his presence in this place? What a gift it is to have a savior who's close to us and who's actually given us a word um, or multiple words, the holy word, um, to guide us in our journey on this earth. And I, um, one of the first scriptures I ever memorized was Psalm 119, 105. And it says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so I hope that you'll cling to that truth this week as we leave this place, just knowing that everything that you need, any situation you face, he's spoken to it and he is good. So we're actually gonna end this morning with a really fun song. You might not know it, but like I said at the beginning of the service, just let the words sink into your heart. Um, it talks about how if God has spoken it, we're gonna take it and we're gonna hold on to it because his word is sure and it's true. So let's worship together as we close the service.
Oh, amen. Are you glad you came to church today? Man, if you were new, if you came even just to uh, be with a family member, um, and if God spoke to you, if you gave your life to Jesus today, we want to know about that. Will you find me? Will you find uh, David? Will you find um, one of us on staff? Uh, because we want to see you live a life that is rooted in the promises of God. And so um, one reminder quickly, newcomer's meal is after the 11 o'clock service. You can pop back in for that if, you, if you're still uh, looking for lunch plans. With that being said, I'd love to just offer a benediction. The word just means a blessing. So if you feel comfortable extending your hands in a posture of reception like this, I'd just love to, to speak these words over you. And now, my brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, when the storm comes and you find yourself waiting without clarity, may you be rooted and anchored in the promises of God that are yes and amen because of your faith and your trust you put in Jesus. May you li live a life that is certain even when you don't know the how. It's not clear. And may that life be abundantly clear to everyone that you encounter that you belong to the Father. And in Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. I love you guys. Thanks for being here today.